The name filled all who heard it with dread as the train approached a remote town surrounded by forest and sitting on a picturesque lake, a tourist destination deep in the heart of Germany, a prisoner peered through a tiny slot in the side of the car and screamed out the name, a name synonymous with death, sending shivers down the spines of women, Ravensbrück. They were being taken to the infamous woman's death camp, which by war's end had been the site of the murder of over 96,000 innocent women. For Corrie Ten Boom and her sister Betsy, <clears throat> both well into their 50s, hell was about to get hotter. They had survived three months separated from each other in a Dutch prison, cold, hungry, sick, followed by three more months at Vought concentration camp where they were worked to the bone and where, on their last day, they heard the summary execution of 700 male prisoners, all husbands, fathers, and sons. They were now on the final leg of a three-day non-stop train trip from Holland to Germany where they had been stuffed on cattle cars like sacks of fertilizer, devoid of proper food, water, space to stretch or sleep, and nothing but a bucket in which to relieve themselves. Now they were about to enter the inner ring of hell where there would be, or might be, no escape. After being marched from the train station through town, spit on by some of the locals, ignored by others, they were taken to an open field directly outside the gates of the camp with a large canopy tent standing in the middle. They were covered by it. It was over their heads. Clinging to one another, Corey and Betsy settled down to rest. But as soon as they had settled down, the guards pushed them all out from underneath the tent. Petty evil, a way to persecute them further. It was there, out on the in the middle of the dirt where they would sleep. When the night came and the rain poured down, they were covered with mud, they were drenched, they were dejected. For most of the next day, they were forced to stand at attention, given little food. They spent another night outside, the blanket still wet, making it hard to sleep. Betsy's cough, a problem for months, was getting worse. By the third night, they were finally marched into the camp and assigned a barrack to barrack number eight built for 400 women, but stuffed with 1,400. With six women sharing a bunk, constructed for two, they were asleep in minutes, exhausted from the ordeal in the previous six days. But they didn't sleep long. Awakened by roll call sometime around 3 a.m., they had to stand in the pre-dawn cold without jackets in blocks of 100 women, 10 rows deep and 10 rows wide. Not allowed to avoid puddles, many women stood for hours in ankle-deep freezing water. They couldn't move. If they had collapsed, they would be beaten. And they were told by other prisoners that if they were unable to get up, they would be, quote, sent to the infirmary, which meant one thing, the gas chamber. At that moment, Betsy leaned over to her sister and whispered, Oh, Corey, this is hell. We had arrived in Ravensbrook on a spring day. It was still very cold. We had just taken our RV across northern Germany. We had, two or three days earlier, we had been in Amsterdam in Harlem where we got to go to the, the Tamboon watch shop. We had got a chance to take our kids into the hiding place. My children got to actually crawl into the space that hid six or, six or seven Jews from the Nazis. And when on that fateful day when Corey and her sister and her father were arrested, the Jews were hiding inside of that hiding place. And for 24 hours, the Nazis tried to find it. They couldn't find it. It was so well done. And eventually, two or three days later, some people who were uh, on their side, part of the conspiracy, were able to let them out and the Jews were able to survive. As the video showed, we were on a pilgrimage for almost a year with our family to teach them about deep faith. And we wanted to go to 10 or 12 of the spots where my heroes lived to make it come alive to them. And Corey Tamboom, about eight or nine months into our trip, was the saint or the Christian that we were studying. We were interested in teaching our kids at this point about suffering. There's no topic that can derail your faith like suffering. There's no situation or experiencing experience like suffering that can throw you off the rails get you to distrust god maybe hate god and maybe turn turn away from god 
we wanted our kids to be prepared to learn from Corey and her sister about the goodness of God in one of the worst places in the world. A month later, in mid-October, Corey and her sister were transferred back to another barracks toward the back of the camp. They had hoped the circumstances would improve, but upon entering, they realized life had just gotten even worse. Instead of individual bunks, they saw great square piers stacked three high and wedged side by side, end to end, with only an occasionally narrow aisle slicing through. Fighting back claustrophobia and the stench of rotting straw and human feces, they climbed to their assigned pier, having to crawl over numerous beds to get to their space. They laid down, then immediately sat up, Corey banging her head against the pier just above her. Fleas, cried Corey. They were everywhere in the straw. And it was at that point that Corey began to lose hope. She said, how can we live in such a place? Her sister Betsy prayed, show us, Lord, show us. Betsy asked Corey to turn in their little Bible, which they had smuggled in the first day in camp, to 1 Thessalonians. Rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Jesus Christ. That's it, Corey, that's the answer. Give thanks in all circumstances, Betsy said. She started to thank God for everything, for knowing Christ, for having a Bible, for being together, for the overcrowding, for the conditions in the barracks, and even the fleas. Wow, that was way too much for Corey. She could not thank God for the fleas, no way. She argued with Betsy, but Betsy countered. Look, it says, give thanks in all circumstances. Betsy reminded her that the all does not just mean the pleasant circumstances. But this time, wrote Corey many years later, I was sure Betsy was wrong. We took our kids first, to, when we walked through the front gate, we took them to Roll Call Square to show them where they had to stand for these many hours in the middle of the night in the cold in flimsy jackets, probably no thicker than this blue blazer I have on. When we were there, it was April. It wasn't even November and December when Corey was there. Uh, and we were freezing. We had our hoods up. We had light jackets on. And the wind coming off the lake was so powerful, it was almost knocking us over. The camp in prison, tens of thousands of women, we were telling our kids. 90, 96,000 women died there. My wife, Michelle, had just read the kids The Hiding Place. How many of you have had that read to you or read it yourself? It's one of the greatest books, I think, written in the 20th century, and I would commend it to you. My kids had it read to them, so they were familiar with Ravensbrook, and so we were uh, excited to, somewhat excited. I don't know how excited you are to go to a concentration camp with your kids, but we thought there were great lessons to teach them here. My wife had said, I remember it, can you imagine, she said, standing in this square at 4.30 a.m. in the cold with nothing but a little tiny flimsy robe on. And as she said that, the wind was just blowing, as I said, so hard off the lake, almost knocking us over. We were asking our kids, how in the world did they remain and keep their faith? How did they struggle through freezing cold, lack of food, the abuse from the guards, death all around them, every day seeing the smoke coming out of the crematorium? How did they do that and not lose their faith? This is what we were challenging and asking, particularly our boys who were 12 and 10 at the time. By mid-December, it was freezing cold. Betsy had descended on the camp. There's a picture. Let me show you this before. There's a picture of Jonathan, one of my sons, running into the wind. It was mid-December, as I said, freezing cold. Temperatures had descended in the camp. Typhoid was rampant, killing hundreds of women every day. The gas chambers were working overtime. Betsy was emaciated from lack of food and covered with infectious sores and scars was dying. She was deathly weak, her 60-year-old body unable to fight off the disease of the overcrowded and vermin-infested camp. She began coughing up blood. Her legs became painfully swollen and soon she was too weak to walk. One morning she found herself unable to get out of bed. Corey and a friend carried her to Roll Call Square and afterwards to the hospital, but they wouldn't admit her because she only had 102 fever. And unless you're at 104, you can't get in. 
They waited a few days. Eventually, she was too weak to even sit up, and they arranged for a stretcher to bring her there. But without proper medication, food, or rest, three things that were in short supply in the camp, she would most likely die. And Corey would lose her best friend, her constant companion, her best encourager. That's Betsy right there. Probably taken a few years before. We had continued uh, to, to uh, tell our kids about the Bible studies that were going on inside of the, inside of the barracks. Uh, every day, sometimes two and three times a day, and this is a photo from Ravensbrook that is in the museum of sorts there. Every day, Corey, because they had this Bible that God allowed them to smuggle in, would hold Bible studies in the different barracks in the afternoon. Leading women to Christ, encouraging them. It, to me, this is remarkable that Betsy would read the scriptures and then Corey, like a good theologian, a woman theologian, would comment on them and preach many sermons to these women. And I think to myself, how in the world did they do that? How in the world did they trust in God's sovereignty and his grace and his love in the midst of that? The only thing I would have thought of would be curling up in my bed every afternoon when I had a moment of free time and cried my sleep into a nap. I don't know how I could have represented God, and yet they did it. They were able to do this, and, and they were able to continue to drive home the point to these women that God loves them. They would often say to the women that there is no pit so deep that Jesus Christ is not deeper still. We, Michelle was trying to drive home the point to them of how God is in control. And she mentioned the story of the fleas, reminding our kids of Corey's struggle to follow Betsy's counsel, to thank God for all things. At the time, Corey could not see how fleas could fit into God's plan. They must be a mistake. I can't give thanks for them, she said. I looked over at Michelle, the wind blowing so hard it was difficult to hear. She was energetically retelling the story of the day, many weeks later, of Corey when she returned to the barracks to find Betsy smiling. I have found out why our clandestine Bible studies have never been discovered by the guards, said Betsy. Why, asked Corey. Earlier that afternoon, said Betsy, there was a dispute among some women in the barracks, and they went outside to get the guard, the female guard, to come in to settle it. But the guard refused to come in. She wouldn't even step through the door. Do you know why? Betsy asked. With an I told you so tone in her voice, Betsy said triumphantly, because of the fleas. The guard said the barracks were crawling with fleas. That is why they never discovered the Bible or the Bible study. Don't you see, Corey? God really is in control after all. We were asking our kids in their own life, what fleas are you having a hard time giving thanks for? And I would ask the same question for you. Are there irritants? Are there trials? Are there struggles right now in your life that you're having a difficult time giving thanks for? And yet God may be using them for something you may never know. You may know in two or three weeks, a year, in hindsight, 10 years later, but you may never know. And yet God is in control. Well, Corey had to see her sister who was in the hospital she finally got permission after a day, but when she got there, she found a surprise. She wiped away the frost on the glass. She peered through the window. At first, two nurses were blocking her view. Then she looked again. At first, two nurses I said, were blocking her view. This time, she saw two nurses wrapping up an emaciated body of a dead patient. It took her a second to realize it, but it was her sister, Betsy. She is dead, Corey moaned. Corey walked back to the barracks, suddenly all alone. One minute her best friend was alive, the next gone. She was flooded with a sense of loneliness, overcome with grief. She screamed out to God, oh God, why do you leave us in this prison so long? Why did Betsy have to die? Will you never rescue me? She was faced with a chance, a choice. Would she grow into bitterness or would she continue to trust God? She said years later, my soul was a battleground of a struggle between light and darkness. Would joy for Betsy's release or grief for my loss win the battle? She had prayed 
teach me, Lord, to bear the, bear the burden in this dark and weary day. Let me not complain to others of a hard and lonely way. Every storm to thee is subject, storms of earth or mind and heart. Only to thy will submitting can to me thy peace impart. So to suffer, to keep silence, to be yielded to thy will. So in weakness learn thy power. Teach me, Father, teach me still. She wrestled, and I talk about in the book this moment when she gets back to the barracks, climbs up on her bed or that pier, and another woman, a Russian woman who's new to the camp is looking for a space. And she goes through this wrestling match in her mind. Do I keep this empty space to have some private time, or do I let this poor suffering woman come up? And I think she could have easily rationalized that I need this time alone. And yet, she decides to reach out and love again and lets this woman come up. And she finds out when the woman gets up there, even through the woman's broken English, she was a Russian woman, that she was a believer. Corey goes back to teach the Bible studies. She's got to be able to tell the women now that even Betsy's death, one of the most loved women in the camp, is not outside of the plan of God. But it wasn't enough just to tell them about how God is sovereign in the midst of suffering. She needed to explain to them that God is also a suffering God. And she went on and relates experiences of having to undress before every Friday appointment with the doctor and how she thought of Jesus on the cross, naked, stripped down, and how her Savior suffered. And she was able to go back to the women and say that God is not only a sovereign God, he's also a suffering God. On the morning of the third day after Betsy's death, something unexpected happened. With 30,000 women standing at attention on Roll Call Square, the loudspeaker blared, Ten Boom, Cornelia. She hesitated. She had been prisoner 66730 so long that she had forgotten her real name. She walked forward. Stand aside, she was ordered. As she stood at the front of the Roll Call Square, she could look back and see tens of thousands of women standing erect, their breath rising in the cold morning air. But she was worried. What did this mean? Had someone reported her Bible studies? Did this mean the gas chamber? Finally, the siren blew. Signaling roll call was over and the women were dismissed back to the barracks. The guard motioned for her to follow him and led her into the administration building. She approached the counter, steadying her badly swollen legs. The man took a slip of paper wrote something on it, signed it, and then stamped, released. At the top of the certificate, it said, Certificate of Discharge. She was taken to the administration building, or out of the building. She was giving, given her watch back, her Dutch money, and her mother's ring were returned. She was given new clothes, a day's bread's ration, food, coupons for three additional days, and a train pass. Good for travel anywhere in Germany. I talk about in the camp how she has to make her way back through worn, torn Germany uh, and what God teaches her over the next few years. Let me end by my final story with my family. Actually, it was alone. We let my kids, my wife took my kids back to the RV because we didn't want them, particularly my six and four year old girls, to see the crematorium. After I had exited the crematorium, my mind filled with images of gas ovens and death and headed to the memorial garden outside the walls of the camp. To my left, the camp wall covered with memorial plaques for the dead, their bodies buried in one large mass grave running along the foot of the wall. I turned to my right to look over the lake, the wind nearly turning off my jacket. In front of me was a huge statue of a woman dressed in prison garb, holding a young child, looking out over the water. She looked forlorn, but at the same time strong, a look of determination on her face. In the distance, I could see a steeple of a church in the heart of Ravensbrook. Corey had mentioned seeing the steeple every day as she walked back from the Siemens factory in her day of hard labor. Was the church calling her, she wondered, or was it mocking her? I wondered as I looked out across that lake, was the God of the steeple silent the whole time that this was going on? Or was that a sign that he was still there and that he wasn't silent? At the time of Betsy's death, Corey realized that although she could not explain it, she believed God was all-powerful and all-good at the same time. He had her times in her hands. He was in control despite the outward circumstances. 
And at the same time, he knew what it was like to suffer because Jesus, his son, had suffered. Sovereign God, suffering redeemer. Only this belief provided hope for Corey. Only this belief impelled her to resist evil. Only this belief motivated her to help others. Perhaps that beautiful steeple may have given her something she desperately needed. The hope that one day all evil and suffering will be judged and eliminated. Revelation 21 says that a day is coming when he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. Why didn't Corey succumb to despair? She held on to the promise of revelation that a better day was coming, a promise that is for all of us. I had spun around looking, looking at the camp, imagining it teeming with thousands of tortured souls, suffering beyond imagination. I tried to imagine what a place like Ravensbrook would look like in the face of God's new future. Revelation 21 says there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And the holy city, Jerusalem, will come down from heaven, cleansing and renewing and perfecting this broken and sinful material world. Ravensbrook and all broken things will be made right. I then thought of the camp without that vision. And, I, and the thought overwhelmed me with depressing, depression. Without hope of a day when all things will be made new, all we are left with is complete despair. It was this truth that sustained Corey every time she walked back into the camp each night. It was this vision that empowered her to trust God in suffering and to continue to serve him. It was this grand view of the future that I wanted my family to embrace now, giving us all a new perspective on suffering. The 10 booms had given my family and me a gift the gift of knowing that in the midst of suffering, God is always with us. But for now, I had to return to my family and start the long drive back to Berlin. I looked for the way back to the RV. The path would take me between the lake and the crematorium. Walking directly over a former mass grave. As I crossed the grave, Corey's words echoed in my mind. No pit is so deep that he is not deeper still. Let's pray. God Almighty, we thank you for your incredible witness to Corey and Betsy in this concentration camp. You are with them. You are good in the midst of suffering. You are sovereign and you are a suffering redeemer. And I pray that these students will understand that so that when the suffering comes, and it may have already come, but when it comes, and it will, they will remember that you are a sovereign God, you are a suffering redeemer, and that no pit is so deep that Jesus Christ is not deeper still. Amen.